Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Turn, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, reading on from where we left off in our earlier reading, verse 18 to verse 25. That's on page 807 in your pew Bible. Matthew 1, reading from verse 18 to verse 25. This is the Holy Word of Almighty God. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, and her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Indeed, how sweet that name, Jesus, is in our ears. We pray now, Almighty God, that you will make that name even sweeter, more delightful, more fulfilling, that we, your people, might not seek the pleasures of this world to be fulfilled, but rather we might look only unto Christ. We cry out to you, Almighty God, be merciful to us. Bless us now as we come to your word. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. And he called his name Jesus. One of the biggest questions in church history has been, who is this Jesus? Who is Jesus? And the most basic answer to our question, certainly from this text, but in all of Scripture, is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if you know your church history, even just a small amount, you'll know what controversy uh, that question and that answer has provided in the church. Uh, Who is Jesus has led to many different answers. And the danger of answering the question incorrectly is that we will end up with the wrong Jesus and thus lose out in an ultimate sense. For if we do not have the right Jesus, then what hope do we have of salvation. Church history has been filled with people who have got the wrong answer to the question, who is Jesus? Many today deny that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Many today in what's known as the church deny who this Christ is. They deny the mystery of the incarnation God made flesh. They deny what the church has historically said in its creeds and from its councils. And as I've mentioned, there is, a, there is everything at stake in answering this question properly. Our own catechism, the larger catechism, answers the question over five questions. So important is this answer of who is Jesus in his divine nature and his human nature. It takes five questions to answer it properly. There's one question. Why was it requisite or necessary that the mediator should be God and man in one person? And the answer is very simple. Why it was necessary for Jesus to be God and man in one person That is this, without the mystery of the incarnation, God with us, Emmanuel, we have no mediator and we have no savior. 
That's why I said everything depends on getting this answer correct. And that's what I want to look at today from this text before us. Matthew 1.18 is Jesus, firstly, as fully man, and then secondly, Jesus as fully God. Fully man and fully God. What does the text say about Jesus as being fully man? There are at least seven testimonies to the true humanity of Christ from this text before us. Verse 18 contains three of those testimonies. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ happened in this way. There is a record by the hand of Matthew of the birth of Christ. There is a testimony to a real child being born. We also read of this, when his mother, Mary, this real child, Jesus, had a real mother with a real name, and her name was Mary. And another testimony, she was found to be with child. That is to say, there was a a visible reflection of her pregnancy. She was found to be with child. Now, unless you're prepared to believe that the Gospel of Matthew is a work of fiction, we do have already, just in this first verse, a real and clear testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ was an historical figure who was really and truly a man, or in this case, a baby, when he was about to be born. Mary found to be with child, to the point that Joseph, her husband, was prepared to annul the engagement under the misconception that she had been unfaithful. So Joseph, another real figure, saw Mary was really and truly pregnant with a real child and was prepared to end the relationship. But there's more testimonies in this verse. Verse 20, move down in the text. And verse 21, there's a birth announcement. We're used to birth announcements today, some of them quite spectacular, but perhaps none as spectacular as this, an angel coming down from heaven to declare the birth of a child. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. There's a divine announcement a message from God to Joseph via an angel that Mary had not in fact been unfaithful to their relationship, but that which was conceived in her womb was by the Holy Spirit. A supernatural act of creation outside of the normal rules of procreation by the Holy Spirit. An announcement that a child, a real child, would be born. And even more, the angel says he is to have a certain name. She will bear a son, verse 21. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. A real child was to be born to Mary, to be named Jesus in order that he might save his people from their sins. Do we not see that the mission to save his people was matched by a capacity or a nature to save his people? That his mission is absolutely tied to his true humanity, his true nature as a human being. Jesus was born a real baby so that Jesus could grow up into a real man with a real mission to save a real people from real sins. That's the testimony of this passage of Scripture. But moreover, there's another testimony, verse 23, that this was prophesied. This very event by the prophet Isaiah, 750 years before the birth of our Lord, was prophesied. God said through Isaiah, yes, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And here in Matthew chapter 1 is the record of that fulfillment that Mary the virgin, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, gave birth 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the final testimony, verse 25. Joseph knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. She gave birth to a son. She gave birth to a real son. Mary experienced, no doubt, real pain in that real birth because a real child was born. Why am I emphasizing this? It's because church history has really mangled this matter of the humanity of Christ. A real child is born. He was called Jesus, and this Jesus would ultimately go to the cross and die at the hands of the Romans and the Jews. And therein has lain the stumbling block for many who would call themselves Christians throughout the age. That God should become flesh and then should die on the cross. It's just not palatable that a great God, a holy God, a righteous God should take to himself a true body and reasonable soul and then die at the hands of his creation. That's just not palatable for so many people. Which is why the humanity of Christ has been the subject of, of so many historical heresies in the history of the church. The Gnostics, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century after Christ, they adopted a teaching called docetism. It comes from the Greek word dokeo, which means to appear or to seem that Jesus only appeared to be human. That he didn't actually have a human body, he just had the appearance. Uh, he was a phantom, they said. He wasn't really a man. They believed, you see, that the divine, uh, which was sacred and holy, could not take on that which was material, human body, because that was sinful. Jesus' body for them was just an apparition. Then move on a century or two, you've got those called the monophysites. Mono, one physical idea of a body or being that Jesus only had one nature, that his human nature was subsumed, overwhelmed by his divine nature. And then there's another group, the monothelites. Mono meaning one again, thelites meaning will, that Jesus only had one will, two natures, divine and human, but his human will was overcome by the divine. You see these ideas in the New Age movement. We see it in Christian science and other areas which tend to strongly elevate the spiritual as being good over the material which is viewed as negative. Brethren, these ideas were, were condemned by the church 1,700 years ago. The Council of Nicaea and then the Council of Constantinople after that uh, came up with the, what we know as the Nicene Creed, which reads about Christ who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And was made man. The Chalcedon definition of 451 says this, The self-same perfect in Godhead, the self-same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. This has been a point that was debated 1,700 years ago and resolved. The councils of the church made it very clear that Christ was truly a man. So why the history lesson? Why the theology lesson in heresies and heretics? There are at least five reasons that our confessional standard says that Jesus had to be a man. At least five reasons, which I'm not going to deal with all of them today. But I want to read you what they are. Why did Jesus need to be a man? The first reason, says our confession, is that he needed to advance our nature. We'll come back to that in a minute. He needed to advance our nature. Secondly, he needed to perform obedience to the law. That's obvious. Born under the law. Third, he needed to suffer and make intercession for us in our own nature. To suffer and make intercession in our nature. Fourth, that he might sympathize with our griefs. Actually, that's part of the same one, sorry. Fourth is that we might be adopted as children. And fifth, that we might pray with hope 
and comfort. If there's one passage of Scripture which kind of summarizes these, it's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2 and verse 14. Why did Jesus need to become a man, a true man? Hebrews 2 and verse 14 reads like this. Since therefore the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, that's to say we're human beings, he himself, Christ himself, likewise partook of the same things, flesh and blood. Jesus became flesh and blood. Why? That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that Jesus helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, that's us. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of his people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now that's a multitude of sermons in its own right. Why did Jesus need to become a man? Truly a man. In order that he might destroy Satan. The one who has the power of death. That's what Hebrews 2, 14, 15, and 16 says. Jesus came sharing in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things in order that through death, his death, he might destroy the one who had the power of death, the devil. Do you hear why Jesus needed to become a man? He needed to become a man in order that he might destroy the one who had the power of death over men. He himself partook of the same things. Verse 17, he had to be made like his brothers. Flesh and blood, true body, reasonable soul. That through his death. And that's a testimony itself, is it not, of his true humanity that he died on a cross. John Owen would write later on of the death of death in the death of Christ. Oh, what glorious truth this is. That death has been swallowed up in the victorious death of Jesus Christ. Consider the power of Satan with death. Consider the power of Satan that he has over you, as it were, with death. The power of Satan is linked here to the power of death. What is it that Satan does to people that brings about death in them? He tempts them. As he tempted Adam and Eve, so he continues to tempt today. As he tempted and entered Judas, which led to his death. So he does so today. Satan is still active, inciting men and women and children to great and abominable acts of wickedness. And that leads to their death. But Satan's also an accuser. He's an accuser of the children of God. That's what the name Satan means. He accuses God's people of the guilt of of present and past sins. And in so doing, he paralyzes, spiritually paralyzes the Christian who is weighed down with that sense of inexcusable, unpardonable guilt of what they have done in the past. And so he tempts us to despair when he tells us of the guilt within. That was Luther's experience, was it not? weighed down by that mass of sin that he was trying all the time to work off by acts of righteousness which he could not do. It wasn't until he understood the gospel of Jesus Christ that Luther was set free from the power of Satan and sin and death. But Satan also does one other thing. He tempts us to question God's word. 
and particularly God's promises. And more particularly, he tempts us to question the sufficiency of Christ Jesus. Is Jesus enough for salvation or do I need to do more? Is it Jesus plus my works? Satan says, yes. Keep thinking that because that will take you further and further and further away from the only true Savior. So he tempts us to think, yes, we need to do more. If only I could do more, God would love me more. If only I could do more, I could get rid of the guilt of past sins. Dear friends, listen to this. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil at the cross. Prophesied in Genesis 3.15, of which we'll hear more about tonight. Jesus' death in Genesis 3.15 was likened to what? A bruised heel. His death was likened to a bruised heel. That's a remarkable likening. How great then the destruction of Satan. How great his destruction must be if his head was crushed at the cross of Jesus Christ. If Jesus' death is likened simply to a bruise on one's heel, how much greater then is the destruction of Satan and all his works for the sake of the Christian? His work is over. Finished. Done. For the Christian, you see, the power of temptation is broken. So much so that the Christian can resist temptation, and we are no longer predisposed to that sin. The accuser can accuse us no more. Why? Because we've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Christ's life and death and resurrection prohibit Satan and sin accusing us of past guilt. My sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he questions God's word or makes us question God's word and God's promises, Are we not reminded that Jesus has already died once for all and he has already risen and he will not die again and he is glorified that he was born according to prophecy and promise. He did die according to prophecy and promise. He was raised from the dead and ascended into glory according to prophecy and promise. Every Every evidence that we need to trust the Word of God has already taken place in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, do you not see the absolute necessity, the absolute necessity for Jesus to truly be a man? Made like us, we read. If you want a phantom Christ one who is not truly man, you're welcome to him. Because you've then got a phantom crucifixion, a phantom atonement, a phantom resurrection, and you are still a slave to sin. Who would want such a thing? Thank the Lord for the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son who took unto himself a true body and a reasonable soul that we might be saved from our sins. But that's not all that it was necessary for Jesus to be. I'll be a bit briefer with this part. Jesus was also fully God. Fully man and yet fully God. This is the mystery of the incarnation. How can it be? How can it be? But it is. Because the text tells us it is. Again, verse 18. Testimonies to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 18, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, this is, itself is a colossal area of study. We can't hope to, to even cover a small part of it this morning. What we have here is a statement that the eternal Son, who has dwelt forever with Father and Spirit, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, should take to himself a true body and reasonable soul and be conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> What great mystery is this? That the immortal should take, should take on mortality. And the eternal should take on the boundaries of time and of space. And as Wesley wrote in one of his hymns, that the sun should be contracted to a span. He should become human. The eternal sun. The second testimony to his deity is found in verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is a New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament name Joshua or Yeshua, which means the Lord is salvation. The name Jesus means Savior. Now, there were many others named Joshua, many others who were named in hope that the Lord would bring salvation, but none named who actually were the Lord who would bring salvation until now, until God with us, Emmanuel, would come. And here he is peculiarly. Joshua is along the line, given the name the Lord is salvation, designed to, to teach the people that they were to follow this man, that they would, they would lead them to 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 a national victory in going into Israel. But this one, we're told, he will save his people, not from their enemies, <clears throat> not from the Philistines or the Romans, but he will save his people from their sins. <coughs> he would save his people a peculiar ownership and extracting a peculiar people from their sins. And perhaps the chiefest evidence is there in verse 23. The chiefest evidence that Christ was also fully God is the prophecy, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel. What a name that is. Come back tonight, please. Please come back tonight, especially if you're visiting. Come back tonight and hear more of the wonderful names of Jesus. Service of lessons and carols tonight. He's called in, in the prophecy in Isaiah, wonderful counselor. This same babe, wonderful counselor. He's called mighty God. He's called everlasting father, prince of peace. Who names a baby these things? <coughs> unless he is God. And yet the church still managed to get it terribly wrong at times. <laughs> Perhaps more historical heresies uh, speaking to the deity of Christ than his humanity. In the second century, there were those who held to adoptionism, that Jesus was just a man, and after a time of testing, he was elevated or adopted to be a son of God. They denied his deity. Chiefly, in the 4th century, was Arius. He said that Jesus was a created creature. Yes, the greatest of all created creatures, but nonetheless, a created creature. He wasn't God. He wasn't the same in substance, equal in power and glory. And then there was Nestorius in the 5th century, that Mary gave birth to Jesus' human nature, not to God and man in one person. Again, the church fathers duked it out again at the councils of the early church. Nicaea, <coughs> we read of Jesus, he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. The Chalcedon definition again in 451, the self-same perfect in Godhead, as well as perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Our own confession of faith speaks like this, the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity being very and eternal God 
of one substance and equal with the Father, did when the fullness of time was come take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof yet without sin. Perhaps you'd be surprised how many people still deny the deity of Christ. 8.5 million Jehovah's Witnesses. 21 million oneness Pentecostals. They believe a lie of Satan that was condemned 1,700 years ago. And they deny the clear testimony of Scripture. The Word became flesh. As John would say, Emmanuel, God with us. Why should it be necessary that the Savior was not only truly man, but also truly God? Our confession this time gives eight reasons. Again, I'm not going to deal with all of them. But let me read it to you. Why is it necessary that the mediator, Christ, should be God, is the question. And the answer is this, that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God. That he might give worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience, and intercession. He might satisfy God's justice. He might procure his favor. He might purchase a peculiar people. He might give his spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to an everlasting salvation. Jesus Christ as God. (coughs) We read there that it's essential for Christ to be God in that he needed to sustain Jesus' humanity. Acts 2, 24, 25, where we read it was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. It was not possible for Jesus to be held by death, because as the psalm said, he will not let his Holy One see corruption. Brethren, it's not only the righteous life of Christ, but an eternal life in Christ, as God, that was necessary for him to be raised from the dead. Not just a human righteous life, but a glorious, unending, eternal life, Jesus as truly God, which raised him from the dead. It was not possible for him to be held by death. Why? Because he's God. Eternally so. From everlasting to everlasting. That's a great assurance for us, dear friends, as Christians. If you're a Christian here today, it's a great assurance for you that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead both as man and God. That though we will die, and that's food for thought for each one of us, is it not? Though we will die, Yet shall you live, because faith in Christ unites you to who? The God-man, Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ unites you to the God-man, Jesus Christ. So that in some remarkable and perhaps undefined way, we share in that eternal life that he had when he was put in the ground. And when he was raised from the ground. But secondly, Christ's deity gives worth to Christ's earthly work. Hebrews 9.11. It tells us that the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament sacrificial system cleansed the exterior of man. Cleansed the flesh. But because Christ has come as God and man and offered up a far better sacrifice. Do you know what's cleansed? Your conscience is cleansed from your sin. Let me say that again. Your conscience is cleansed from your sin because Jesus Christ is the God-man. I don't know how we would live without that knowledge. That our consciences, stricken, 
stricken by sin. Our sin and the knowledge thereof are enabled this day to be clear and clean before Almighty God. Because Jesus is the God-man. There is an excellency in Christ and his work which we could never, ever conceive of were it not revealed to us in Holy Scripture. It's because of this excellency that we have found favor with God, that he is a propitiation uh, towards God for our sins, that we are reconciled with God, that Satan and all his enemies, including our own sin, are destroyed by the work of this Christ. That's why the Christian, even in the midst of the greatest hardship, is actually living a life, ultimately, of victory. I know it doesn't feel it sometimes, does it? But that's because our eyes are fixed on the trouble and fixed on life. Were we to fix them upon Christ, the God-man, we would see that Satan himself has been cast down. And that we have the victory. the eternal Son made flesh to live as us, to represent us, to do the works that we could not do that we might be saved. Dear friend, let me bring this to a conclusion. I'm concerned there may be some here today who don't know Christ. Perhaps you deny the claims of Christ. And you're differing with everything that's been said today and what's been said for thousands of years and will be said for all eternity. Oh, please hear us. Please hear us. Not for one moment because we think we're any better than you. Not because we think we're any better than you. But just because these are the words of eternal life that you must repent of your sin. Repent of making God or yourself God and put God in the place where he belongs and love Christ and live for him and flee to him for forgiveness. Surely you can see your sin, can you not? You must know it. Everyone else can see it. Please flee from your sin this day. Children, and older people alike, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But if you're here with faith, surely you've come here today not to be impressed or to sit in judgment on a preacher. Surely you've come here for better reasons than that. You've come to worship, haven't you? You've come to adore him, Christ the Lord. And do you not see, brethren, you have every reason to do that. Every reason to bow and worship this remarkable Jesus Christ. God has lived with us. God has lived as us. With us and for us. That he might die for us and also be raised for us. This one, Jesus Christ, not only surpassing all human perfection, human holiness, even a wonderful earthly sonship, one who never sinned against his Father, we have also in Christ Jesus the eternal God, the one without beginning of days and end of life, who for love came down from heaven, to be placed in the womb of the Virgin Mary, to grow up a righteous one, and to die at Calvary's cross. This is staggering. The incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he who made the angels should for a time become a little lower than the angels. Brethren, let's adore him. Not just now, as we go out through those doors, Let our lives adore him. 
Let us come and give glory, yes, as we'll sing in a moment, to the newborn king. Let's pray. Almighty God, we praise you, honor you, and glory in your name. How humbled we are by our Savior's great love for us and his great working on our account. Have mercy upon us. Forgive our many sins and work in us a love which does not fade, a love which does not diminish, and a trust in all your goodness towards us. Have mercy upon your people. Bless us with faith. Bless those that do not know you with repentance and faith, that your name may be magnified in our midst this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Take your hymnal again, please, and turn to number 292. Let all mortal flesh keep silence, and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly-minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descendeth, our full homage to demand. Let's stand and we'll sing number 200.